Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. If you'd like to know the latest intel on any commercial real estate related topics, check out our on demand show podcasts. For example, we just produced separate shows on the office, industrial, and the retail markets, and another informative show on management strategies that add value. There are lots of interesting shows to choose from. You can access the shows on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Just visit iTunes or the show website, commercialrealestateshow.com. Well, today we're considering some of the factors in the current market affecting a company's lease versus purchase decision. Please welcome my next guest, Daniel Latshaw, an MBA, a CCIM, and a partner with Bull Realty, a U.S. commercial real estate sales and consulting firm headquartered in Atlanta. Daniel's practice focuses on helping companies and nonprofits with their commercial real estate needs. Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. Glad to be here. Thank you. Also, please welcome Deborah Heron. Deb is a CPA and a senior VP with Georgia Small Business Capital, which is a CDC, a certified development company, a nonprofit company designed to assist borrowers and lenders to utilize the SBA 504 loan program. And they work in Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. Deb, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Michael, for having me. Well, we appreciate it. And, and Daniel, I'd like to start off with some advice that you would give a company that comes to you and they're saying well we don't know if we should buy or lease you know what are some of the first question questions that you ask a company who's considering new space requirements uh, and is possibly open to buying well my, Michael first and foremost as was alluded to earlier mm -hmm. we'd ask about the company mission mm -hmm. you know simply put your facilities decisions should mirror that strategy and decision making from the top from your mission but to getting down to the nitty-gritty we ask questions such as you know what what kind of growth do you expect um, do you see relocation do you see downsizing do you see uh, growth you know in the future for your space on the uh, horizon uh, these are all going to affect lease first purchase what's your threshold for pain and there's some work to be done if you own real estate there's management involved uh, what, painful, how, painful. painful. <laughs> <laughs> how important are our location? How important are signage? We talked about tax issues. And ultimately comes down to what's, what's your cost of capital? In other words, what sort of return does your business generate? Let's take a pro forma of real estate and compare the two and see what's the best use for your capital. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And they also need the right type of space in, in the right location, right? So if their build business is going to flourish, they have to be in the right location. So if they can't find the right location to buy, I guess leasing is typically going to offer more uh, location options, right? That's right. We, we try to encourage our clients uh, not to put their blinders on. Sometimes people think, I'm, I'm going to buy. Dad gum and I'm gonna buy, <laughs> or dad gum and I'm gonna lease, mm -hmm. but to uh, really, uh, you know, purchasing space is not for everyone. Yeah. And, and yes, um, leasing provides flexibility uh, that that purchase doesn't. I mean, for instance, in that case of location, we provide probably for every, uh, you know, for for a dozen lease spaces, you might find one building in that submarket for for sale. Right. Right. You know, that's interesting because I think one of the concepts today that we have. Uh, in our current market is in, and in some cities and in some areas uh, you do have better locations uh, better choices to buy so I think that's one of the remarkable things about the timing that we currently have is is there are some good choices sometimes and, you know and sometimes a company can actually reduce their occupancy costs by buying and and or, or maybe at least control their costs from escalating every year <clears throat> uh, can you share the the typical math in a lease first purchase uh, analysis Sure, sure. Yes, uh, there, there initially is an a, a cash outlay, but after that, really mm -hmm. on paper, when you stack up <clears throat> occupancy costs, lease first purchase, in most cases, I think the math points to purchase. Mm -hmm. Take a building that we worked on uh, at $823,000, 10% down, 5% interest rate, 20-year <clears throat> amortization. Deb will tell me if that's uh, legitimate for this market, but I believe it is. And that's add correct. taxes, insur insurance costs to maintain the property, and compare that with a lease space at 18 bucks a square foot. <clears throat> All things basically being equal, your monthly outlay for purchase, 7400 lease, 9100 That's a $1,700 savings for purchase. Bam! 
<laughs> you know, as the infomercial guy says. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Or you could sell Sham Wild doing that. I think. <laughs> but that's only year one. Yeah. And investors sometimes hyperventilate about the initial uh, yield Down payment <laughs> uh, first year. But that's not why people buy real estate. Yeah. You know, look at it over t- ten years. The lease, well, it escalates. Your your whereas your uh, mortgage payment is fixed, and you choose to purchase. Well, guess what? After ten years, you've saved up in this example two hundred and eighty-one thousand by way in the form of principal reduction, and not to mention your buildings appreciated. Yeah, so that's interesting. So instead of having escalating rents every year, that I don't know about you, but every lease I've done, uh, typically, well, not everyone, but most every one of them it escalates annually. Uh, and then if you if you have fixed in your interest rate, you've you pretty much got a fixed in cost if you buy, right? Absolutely. Um, and then you're getting some return. So you also have that principal reduction. Uh, every year that you own the property mm-hmm. you know that's interesting you know I've, I've been in this business 30 years and when I've sold buildings for business owners it's interesting I've heard this a lot that you know what they went in kicking and screaming <laughs> to buy their building <laughs> they didn't really want to buy they bought it because they were tired of moving or they're tired of their interest rates I mean their uh, rents going up every month and they didn't really want to buy what they bought but then what they tell me is that boy it's it, it was a surprise to them mm-hmm. you know it was this windfall that they didn't even think about when they were buying uh, and you know all of a sudden I think when you when you're running a business or you own a business time flies when you're paying bills right <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> what it's been uh, 10 years now and then you look down you've got a lot of equity right absolutely uh, according to the urban lands institute and ernst and young recent report office rents are pro- projected to increase four percent each year for 2014 and 2015 and that's not even with a doomsday prediction of inflation mm-hmm. so in other words uh commercial real estate is a fantastic hedge against inflation and you know like you i could tell you story after story of folks who even if they didn't perfectly time the market when they bought their business Mm -hmm. location for their business 10 20 years passes by like a dream in the night they come to me near retirement to sell their building and they you know they say to me hey you know my business it was the skills that paid the bills you know it was what uh, how i made a living but i quietly accumulated wealth over the years just by simply making my monthly payments yeah that's interesting and and we're short on the break but uh if you could touch on daniel on pricing i mean in some cases prices are available below replacement costs uh, tell us what you see there absolutely CoStar actually in one of the recent reports pegged Atlanta office rates, uh, office sales prices on average at 113 a square foot. Mm-hmm. Now, that's cheap. Mm-hmm. Now, that's well below replacement costs and that's what we're finding. You can't build it for that. Prices are going up and, and I don't believe there's ever been a better time to buy. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I talked to a bunch of accountants and construction folks before the show and said, so, you know, if you tried to average a cost per square foot, to, to replace an office property, you know, what would you use? I mean, you've got the soft costs, the land costs, development costs, you've got, you know, the zoning costs, and, and then you've got the sticks and bricks and everything else. And they said r- roughly you could use 150 bucks. So what you're saying, you know, <coughs> roughly 37 bucks a square foot mm-hmm. under replacement costs is kind of hard to go wrong there, isn't it? Can't go wrong, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, I've listed a, a building, bank owned, downtown mm-hmm. Atlanta. 12,000 square foot office condo for 59 bucks a square wow. foot. Wow. All right, I want to hear more about that. we got to take a break here. More on lease first purchase decisions. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by your friends at Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com or call 800-408-BULL. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. You're invited to check out our YouTube channel. There are three sections of videos there. There's a market updates channel where there's updates on office, retail, industrial, and some of the smaller sectors. Uh, There's also a section on market intel, commercial real estate intel, and there's videos there on uh, leases, contracts, uh, broker agent strategies, uh, and then there's a section on available properties. So just visit YouTube and search for the channel Commercial Real Estate Show. 
Well, today we're considering some of the factors in the current market affecting a company's lease versus purchase decision. We have Deb Heron here with us today and Daniel Latshaw. And, and Daniel, I'd like to ask you about the lease versus purchase decision when it comes to visibility. I mean, I think you, you typically see a lot of companies lease in a multi-tenant office building where they don't have a lot of visibility. Well, sometimes they can go buy that smaller building and maybe buy a freestanding building and, and then have visibility and signage and that sort of thing. Have you seen that benefit some of the uh, tenants who have become uh, owners? <clears throat> Absolutely. If you own, Michael, an insurance agency, real estate company, <laughs> hypothetically, um, Hypothetically, a law firm, know. dental practice, you want to have a presence in that community, and and bricks and mortar is a great way to have that that presence. In other words, why be down the street in a big multi-tenant, you know, hidden away building when uh, you know people can pass you by all the time, and if they know where you are, they, it's it's easier to visit. Uh, look, and it's hard to quantify uh, the value of owning a building with that kind of exposure, but. Uh, Try shopping for billboard space. You'll find out. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you can pay a lot of money for a billboard, and maybe you get that uh, with a building, and you can look at the traffic counts and see if that's mm -hmm. advantageous to you, especially if you're if your practice or your business. Uh, I know we had a couple of law firms that recently bought buildings on major thoroughfares, and um, you know I think they're benefiting greatly by having their sign out in those communities and mm -hmm. picking up that Absolutely. business. Well, we talked about cycles briefly mm -hmm. um, in, in the show so far and, and how buying in a recovery portion has historically been a, a great time to buy. I mean, we, we know it will cycle, right? There's no question real estate cycles. It's, it's really guessing how long that cycle is going to take and how deep or, or high it's going to go, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, you, you can bet more equity and more pre-leasing and more guarantees will, will be required to obtain construction loans for quite a while. So, you know, I think we're still going to have levels of, of low construction levels. And, and what has that done to, to values lately and rents? And how might this, this affect the market going forward if you're deciding to lease or purchase? Mm -hmm. If there's little to no construction coming down the pike, what does that mean for you? Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's no secret that there's mm -hmm. been very little development mm -hmm. over the past five years, and, and even projects that Shh, are planned. Don't tell everybody. <laughs> tell or, everybody, Daniel. <laughs> or projects under construction are still yeah. months or years away. Yeah. So the current positive absorption rate mm -hmm. is expected to continue. Uh, you know, if you look specifically at the average square footage of new deliveries of office product over the last 30 years. According to CoStar, in any single year, it tends to be 150 million square feet. Last few years, we've seen 51 million, <clears throat> 31 million, 36 million, 53 million. Yeah, we're going to see some upward pressure on rents in the next few years because of the lack of supply. There's very little product that's come out. Yeah, I think even in markets that have were hit pretty hard, uh, if you take Atlanta for example, you know, the, the, we're now seeing that market see some rate increases, mm -hmm. and we're seeing the incentives go away. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we're all going to be a little surprised, having just been beat down, you know, in this recession mm -hmm. as we all have, yeah. that how high, how fast rents could go up when you have this severe lack of, of new construction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's going to be interesting to see. Now, of course, if you're leasing, then you're going to have to deal with those rates. Um, if you're owning, well, maybe you benefit from those rates. So again, you know, buying may not be right for everyone and every company, uh, but it's certainly an incredible time to, uh, to look at it and uh, consider if it's right for you. Daniel, the prices right now and where we are in this recovery in, in some markets, vacant buildings or buildings that have a lot of vacancy are really discounted price-wise. <clears throat> but then again, if you if in the investment market is hot, so fully leased buildings are very hot and very valuable. What could that mean for a tenant that that's buying a vacant building and then <clears throat> filling it up with their with their company? It's an awesome opportunity. <clears throat> There's a dynamic that's going on in Atlanta and a lot of markets across the country. That, uh, this of, of haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. If a building has a tenant, it has value. If, if, if it doesn't, it's very limited <clears throat> and you can pick up buildings on the cheap. Uh, so here you come, Mr. or Mrs. Potential Owner Occupant, and you possess the key to unlocking real estate value. I mean, the moment you sign that lease with yourself, guess what? You know, you've added tremendous value, which some businesses might even tap, tap into for themselves. 
immediately in the form of a sale lease back. I mean, back to the $59 square foot uh, downtown Atlanta uh, office bank owned that just put on the market. And what's that going to be worth the moment a company buys it and does a sale lease back? I'd say double value overnight. Yeah, I want to get into that. And more on the lease versus purchase analysis. I'm Michael Bull. You're listening to the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by France Media. France Media provides exposure to the world of commercial real estate. Visit francemediainc.com or call 404-832-8262. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We have some incredible shows coming up for you, including a show on tax credits to save you money on taxes, a show on group investing and the changes in advertising for investors and crowdfunding, and a show on commercial real estate associations. Don't miss a show of special interest to you. Sign up for a once a week email announcing the show topic at commercialrealestateshow.com. Well, today we're discussing some of the factors in the current market affecting a company's lease versus purchase decision. We have uh, Deb Heron with Georgia Small Business Capital with us today and Daniel Alatshaw with Bull Realty. And Deb, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the the lending side because, you know, it's a special time, really. I think that's one of the factors that's pretty special in the lease versus purchase decision analysis right now interest rates are are really low i mean historically speaking lenders seem to really be interested in owner occupants so you know why are lenders so interested in doing owner occupied loans right now absolutely well first of all michael thank you again for having me on the show Mm -hmm. um very simply put uh, Mm -hmm. lenders are interested in commercial owner occupied uh, financing over investment property because it has lower risk and um, it's it like, a, like a home, right? Owner occupant homes do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it also gives them the opportunity to build a relationship with that particular borrower because every bank that I work with today uh, is all about relationship lending and not just making a loan, but also the products and services that go with every operating company, such as depository accounts cash management services, et cetera. So they're trying to build relationships and it's a good way to get their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we're basically seeing all different types of banks, anybody who's lending out there interested in uh, these types of loans. Mm -hmm. And the competition's very, very steep, especially if the operating company that is gonna be in the actual uh, building uh, is performing well. Right. And, and tell us a little bit about the CDCs around the country. I mean, CDCs are, are a nonprofit, <clears throat> and they're out there around the country to, to help borrowers and lenders uh, with these SBA loans, right? That's correct. Um, there are certified development corporations in mm-hmm. every single state. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, all states have multiple mm-hmm. certified development corporations. Mm-hmm. So they can actually roll out this SBA 504 loan program with their bank partners to the end user, the borrower. Um, interesting enough, you know, I, I always have to say, being here in Atlanta, that um, you know, CDC does not serve us as well here in this market. <laughs> um, sometimes people ask, why are you bringing somebody from the Center of Disease Control out? <laughs> Um, to 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 talk about a building loan, but we are actually a certified development corporation. Okay, and the down payments uh, can be pretty leveraged on SBA. What what's uh, what, what's the range of down payments for SBA versus conventional right now? Well, that that's a great question, and that's a real selling. Um, Uh, point for Mm -hmm. SBA loans. Mm -hmm. Um, What we're seeing for conventional today, because of everything that's happened in the economy, um, anywhere down payments will be from 15% up to 25%. And that's really going to depend upon not just the borrower, but the property type. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. With SBA loans, in comparison, it allows the borrower to to preserve their working capital, because most of the time, they're going to be looking at a 10% down payment. Um, Mm -hmm. The only time that we would vary from, from that would be if the actual borrower is considered to be a startup, uh, and that means they've been in business for less than two years, mm-hmm. or uh, the property is special purpose. And in that case, the SBA will require an additional 5%. So um, it's just, it's very, very attractive for the borrower. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that is amazing. Now, um, this show is, is broadcast in 12 stations around the country right now and this weekend. And uh, But the show will be popular for, for a long time on the Internet and uh, iTunes and things. So I preface this next question with that in case interest rates have changed. But what are you seeing for interest rates right now on these loans? Well, interest rates, um, ironically enough, they have been hovering in the fours for a long mm -hmm. period of time. And um, I probably would say for the last um, 12 to 18 months, that's what we have been seeing. But recently, we've seen an uptick in interest rates. They're, they're, they're now in the, um, I would say, low to, to mid 5% range. Um, but, you know, these are great rates because mm -hmm. they get locked in long term. And um, I was actually just, you know, trying to jog my memory on prime rate, you know, and, you know, we have been in this economy for so long now, and it's at 3.25% today, mm -hmm. um, but we forget. Um, back December of just 2007, which is really not that long ago, it was actually 7.25%. So um, we, we've been in this false sense of a low prime rate environment. Uh, so I would suspect interest rates are slowly but surely going to start increasing. Okay. Are you typically going to get a lower interest rate with an SBA loan or with a conventional? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Typically, you're going to see the same uh, interest rate. Mm -hmm. Once again, it goes back to who is the borrower, how strong is the borrower, and they're going to look at the financial history of that particular borrower. Uh, the difference really is going to be a bank is going to have much more incentive to lock in that interest rate longer term with an SBA product mm -hmm. uh, versus doing it on a conventional basis. And, and, and the reason being, especially under the SBA 504 loan program, is because they're going to end up having probably no more than 50% of that total loan, where the SBA is going to take you know, up to 40% of that 504 loan. So therefore, they have a, a lower uh, risk, okay. you know, lower loan to value. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. More on the lease versus purchase decision and more on these SBA loans. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by your friends at Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com or call 800-408-BULL. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Well, today we're discussing lease versus purchase analysis and the extraordinary circumstances with that decision in the current market. My guests are Deb Heron and Daniel Latshaw. And Deb, I'd like to ask you the difference between the SBA 504 and the SBA 7A. What are the basic differences in those programs? Absolutely. Um, it's a great question, and mm -hmm. I get asked that question quite often. Um, the SBA 504 uh, loan program was really designed to help help um, business owners finance commercial owner-occupied real estate. And that can be either an existing building that they need to do renovations to, or it can actually be ground-up construction, which we actually see that from time to time for some of our smaller businesses. Um, in addition, I always like to say the best way to describe a 504 loan is you create a bucket of dollars and you put in eligible costs. Um, you can also include FF&E uh, and equipment. Um, and closing costs, as long as the key, the appraisal supports ultimately the loan values. But um, the, the primary differences I like to break down between a 504 and a 7A really kind of come into four areas or four categories. One, the 504 loan program is a shared loan program where the 7A is done solely by the bank and the bank is actually getting a guarantee from the SBA. But going back to my um, example of a bucket of dollars, um, you create this bucket of dollars under the SBA 504 loan program and, and the bank comes in and typically does a 50% first mortgage and we follow suit behind with a, up to a 40% second mortgage. So once again, a shared loan program. Secondly, um, the 504 loan program is known for having long-term fixed rates. What we're seeing from our bank partners, uh, normally they'll lock in that first mortgage rate for uh, 10 years, possibly with a 20-year amortization. And then the SBA is actually always behind in a 20-year fixed rate. So the benefit for the borrower is to get a blended, blended fixed rate. Third would be collateral. 
And um, under the 504 loan program, the bank takes a first position on the assets that we're financing, and the SBA takes a second. So outside of personal guarantees, which are required on, on all loans, as you guys know, um, most loans, I should say, um, that's all the collateral. So in comparison, on the 7A, um, they could take a blanket filing on all of the business assets. They could also be required, if there's a shortfall in collateral, to take a, a lien on your personal residence. Yeah, I've heard that with the 7A. Yes. Right, and so and so, a lot of borrowers shy away from that. They yeah. really just want the business debt to be supported by business assets, okay. just simply put. Okay. And then finally, the fees. Um, there are fees associated with this program, SBA fees, and the 7A tends to have um, higher fees than the 504 because, you know, once again, simply put, the 504 is just four, up to 40% of the loan, where the 7A is a much larger um, dollar amount. Okay, and I've heard since the 7A is the total loan amounts with the bank, and 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 basically half of it is with the 504. I've heard some people say that the loan officers maybe push you to the 7A because they big get a bigger fee. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That that's a real possibility. So yeah. I always always mention to my borrowers, know your options because at the end of the day, they need to understand if they're going to their lender, they need to understand, hey, am I would a conventional solution be available to me for what I'm looking to do? They need to also uh, be be smart enough to ask questions about not just SBA in general, but the actual two uh, primary programs, which is the SBA 504 loan program and the SBA 7A. Okay. Well, our fun has to end here soon. Can you give us a quick tip for our listeners, Deb? I think the best tip that I can provide to any borrower out there um, is do your homework. If you are looking to finance commercial owner-occupied real estate, you need to understand from your lender what are the options and ask a lot of questions. And consider maybe running this by another lender, too, to make sure that you're getting all the information that's out there. And this is going to help you make the best decision that you can for your business. All right. With Deb, uh, Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Thank Thank you. Well, I hope you can join us next Next week, we're going to talk about real estate syndication strategies. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh, and join us for the Commercial Real Estate Show. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by your friends at Bull Realty, France Media, Atlanta Office Liquidators, and Wiseman, Noack, Curry, and Wilco. For more information about these companies or to access additional show podcasts, videos, or blogs, visit commercialrealestateshow.com.